Hello, eighth grade medieval history students. This is the same day and the same location, and I just finished recording the last lecture, but I took off my sweater, so it at least looks like it's a different day. In our last lecture, we discussed the Lombards, who were ultimately defeated by the Franks under Charlemagne. So now I want to discuss the Franks before we dive into Charlemagne himself. The Franks are probably the most important kingdom in early medieval Europe as they define the boundaries between two modern countries. Can you guess what those two modern countries are? Germany and France. And they also define the original rulers of these two regions. Additionally, the Franks conquer much of Western Europe between the years 500 and 840 AD, which is a very significant stretch of time. So we will talk in more detail again about their history and their political structure and eventually we will get into some of their more important kings as well. Beginning with the history of the Franks. The Franks are the ethnic group who have a long history that dates all the way back to the Roman times in the early 200s AD. However, the Franks left no written record from that time period, which is a common thing with these Germanic barbarian tribes. The only records we have of the Franks from that time period is written by the Romans, and you can imagine that when the Romans write about barbarian people groups who they view as lesser than themselves, their records are going to be a bit biased. Therefore, our view of the early Franks is distorted from a Roman perspective. By the 5th and 6th century, the history of the Franks begins to clear up a little bit. In the 5th century, the Franks had moved into the region that is today called Northern France and Northwest Germany. By the way, I mentioned this before, but the name France comes from the word Frank. In the German language, this is even more evident. The word for France in the German language is Frankreich, which is butchered by me, but it literally means the Frankish kingdom. It's also where the name Frank comes from. Regardless, the region that the Franks settle is what is now Northern France and Northwestern Germany. Of course, in the fifth century, France and Germany, these regions did not exist as France and Germany. The Franks would have called their region Nuestria and Austrasia. The people who lived in Northern France were known as the Salian Franks, and they lived in the part that is called Nuestria. And those in what is now Northwestern Germany were called Ripurian Franks, and their territory is Austrasia. These two groups of Frankish people ruled two different kingdoms, that's four, but two different kingdoms in Europe. As history becomes more clear and the Western Roman Empire falls, one dynasty, or royal family as you know, becomes dominant in the Frankish world. I'm going to wait for this plane to pass because it's loud. Wow, the sky is so blue. And the moon hits your eye like a big piece of pie. One dynasty, or royal family, becomes dominant in the Frankish world, and this is the Merovingian family. The Merovingians, under a king named Clovis, come to dominate most of Western Europe. Clovis expanded his realm into southern France, east into modern-day Germany, and west into Belgium and the Netherlands. Clovis was able to secure all of this territory. However, things went a little poorly after he died. And this is when we get to talk about the political structure a little bit of the Franks and their understanding of hereditary kingship. We tend to think of medieval inheritance of kingship in these terms. We tend to think that when a king dies, his entire region that he owns, his entire territory and his title is passed on to his eldest son or in the absence of an eldest son to his nearest male relative. This system is actually a much later development and it's known as primogenitor, which means firstborn. Well, as I mentioned, the primogenitor hereditary system didn't develop until much later in medieval history. During the time of Clovis, who lived during the fifth and sixth centuries, a different hereditary structure existed. When the Frankish kings died, their entire kingdom would be split between all of their remaining living sons. Think about that for a second. Who thought that was a good idea? So when Clovis died, his entire kingdom, which was massive, 
was split between his sons. Well, as you can imagine, this caused massive internal conflict, warfare among brothers. Clovis was able to secure a vast amount of territory for the Merovingian family, but it was immediately divided at his death. And as a result, the Franks would not hold such a large area under a single ruler again until Charlemagne. This leads us to geography. Geography has its place in our lives, but usually it's only as far as our GPS on our smartphone tells us, right? We don't have to worry too much about mountains or great seas because we have airplanes and we have boats and navigating systems that allow us to take detours and get to places we want to get within matters of hours. However, in the medieval world, geography was a huge factor in politics and in the structure of the medieval world. Without the ability to fly over mountains or navigate through difficult territory or cross the sea with ease, geography was an important factor in shaping the politics and the socio-economy of a kingdom during this time. If you look at the Frankish kingdoms that we've described in Western Europe, you can see that they are almost all landlocked. That means that almost all of them are surrounded by land. Yes, some of them touch water, but they are not connected by water. Now think about the Roman Empire which borders the Mediterranean Sea. The whole thing is built around a giant sea. The Frankish kingdom is north of the Mediterranean and almost entirely separate from it. This means that the Franks controlled land that was difficult to traverse and major cities were only accessible by rivers or roads, not oceans or seas, as it had been possible to cross great distances in the Roman Empire by just crossing the Mediterranean in the Frankish kingdoms, you had to go on a long journey on foot. This means that the Franks never became very good sailors. They never had much use for seafaringness. So what? What does this have to do with anything? Sailing allows several things. Firstly, you can move troops more efficiently. Also, it's a source of food. You can fish. Probably most importantly, though, is that you can move goods over long distances, which results in trade. You can trade with other kingdoms if you're able to use the sea well. And if you can trade, then you get a bustling, busy, wealthy economy, which leads to a wealthy kingdom. Since the Franks did not delve into seafare and are landlocked, they were not able to perform long distance trade. So how did they acquire wealth? Well, through warfare. So because of geography, largely, the Frankish kingdom is really centered around warfare. This becomes the defining characteristic of the Frankish kingdom, especially under King Charlemagne. Let's discuss the politics of the Frankish kingdom. The political structure of the Frankish kingdom, I will describe it at its ideal. Obviously, all systems break down at some point under certain individuals, but this is basically how the Franks structured their kingdom when things were working as they should. On top of the system was the king. The king in his realm, in the Frankish realm, is sovereign. His word is law, and no one can disobey the king without punishment, which would either be financial or physical. In the early medieval period, the church didn't yet have the power to influence local politics. Remember, the papacy's power evolves over time, especially with Gregory the Great. So that doesn't happen right away. As a result, Frankish kings in the early period largely governed without any oversight from the papacy. That changes in the later Middle Ages when the pope becomes more powerful. In the later Middle Ages, the king will be hugely influenced by the pope. The early medieval Frankish kings sat on top of the political system. Now. Our idea of kingship is usually influenced by more later medieval and early modern kings who are rarely seen on the battlefield. They are more figureheads, um, ideals, representations, but not so with the early medieval, not so with the kings in the early medieval world, especially the Frankish ones. The Frankish kings were first and foremost warriors. The system in which the Frankish king functioned was a chieftain-based system. You will recall in our lecture on barbarians how the warriors and chieftains related to one another, and hopefully you can see how the Frankish kings and the political system of the Frankish kingdom is an evolution of the earlier barbarian warrior and chieftain relationship. The king was the chief warrior, and those around him were also warriors. The king was responsible for nurturing and feeding those in his company, and they returned 
the favor by swearing loyalty to him. They were expected to follow him into battle, and if anyone refused to follow the king into battle, he was removed from the circle and replaced by another willing warrior, of whom there were many. Over time, the Franks conquer large amounts of territory and needed a system to control their lands. What they end up using is remnants of the former Roman Empire in order to structure their political system. The Franks used former Roman fort towns in Europe. These forts are in the perfect location for trade and defense. They were often located near major waterways like the Rhine River, and these forts often had some of the remaining Roman fortifications and rampart, which allowed the Franks to maintain and develop a reliable system of towns and roads across their realm. Keep in mind that during the early medieval period, cities were very small, not anywhere near the size of what they are today, you can think of them as more glorified towns. This leads us to the capital of the Frankish kingdom. There really wasn't a capital city. The Frankish kings were itinerant, and itinerant is a good word that you should know, so here's a definition. Itinerant means traveling from place to place. So if the Frankish kings were itinerant, you can realize that the Frankish kings traveled from place to place. They were not stationed at a single location or capital city. They moved across their realm from one major town to another. In so doing, they were able to effectively govern vast territories. As they traveled, their retinue came with them. Now, here's another good word that you should know, retinue. Retinue is a group of advisors, assistants, or others accompanying an important person. Basically, the Frankish courts were mobile, not stationary. Now, in spite of the mobility of the king and his court, he can still only be in one place at one time. So how is a king supposed to handle a situation where perhaps two rebellions break out in different places at the same time? Well, that was the job of the chief office, an individual known as the mayor of the palace. This is an important role that you should probably remember. The mayor of the palace is the role that both Charlemagne's father and grandfather held during the final years of the Merovingian dynasty. More on that later, I hope. The mayor of the palace, whoever it was, was responsible for maintaining the realm through administration and military duties. They organized military campaigns to expand the realm, protect its borders, and put down military uprisings from disloyal vassals. There was a mayor of Austrasia and a mayor of Neustria. During the 680s, the two Frankish realms were unified, but each had its own mayor up until the rule of Charlemagne's father in the 750s. During the 680s, the two Frankish realms of Austrasia and Neustria had their own mayors. Austrasia had its own mayor of the palace and Neustria had its own mayor of the palace. This is up until the rule of Charlemagne's father in the 750s, at which point they became completely unified permanently without having their own individual mayors. Well, prior to that, each mayor would have been responsible for the governance of their respective realms. In the time period between the 680s and the 750s, the two separate mayors would theoretically have reported to the single Merovingian king, who was the ruler of both realms, and that is the political structure. Back to warfare. The Frankish kingdom is militaristic. It was centered around warfare. We've mentioned that already. The king was a warrior and around him were his knights and vassals. It's a bit early to call them knights and vassals. Those terms develop later, but it sort of fits. So we're going to go ahead and use it. The knights receive land in exchange for loyalty. After war, they also receive large shares of the loot as well. Land is money and power. Granting land was a wage. Land can be farmed, which provides goods that can be traded for wealth, which can provide for the knight whatever he wants. The king's knights were firstly warriors. They would have spent their whole life training for combat in the battlefield. They were hardened and lethal forces. They were able to devote so much time to combat training because they had peasants to work the land for them. When the king went to war, his most well-paid knights would have brought soldiers along with them because they would have been rich enough to be able to afford to have their own soldiers. The knight was usually a cavalryman, meaning he rode a horse, but the soldiers he brought with him would have been primarily footmen. And this warfare and these soldiers would be how a knight would compensate the king for the land that he had received. And so these are the features of the Frankish kingdom and a little glimpse into the Merovingian dynasty, who unfortunately will have to skip over for the sake of time and go straight to the dynasty that came after the Merovingians, which is the Carolingian dynasty with Charlemagne, his father and grandfather. And we will discuss them in our next lecture.